Good evening, social media family, Christian Bible study group. I want to welcome you to Revelation chapter 19 this evening. Very happy to have you here with me. We're going to see how long the Lord gets me um, through this and when he tells me I'm finished. Usually when I'm on these Bible studies, when I'm uh, about out of things to say, what's on my mind, that's when I know he's telling me I'm done. And I want to welcome you all, like I said again, that you're here with me on these Bible studies. A, long, a lot of you have been on a long journey with me, some of you for many years. And some of these events that we're seeing in the world today are unprecedented and historic, world-changing. You know what I have in the title that you're reading here? You may have come on and you've seen this in the title and you're like, oh, where have I heard that before? Where is the promise of his coming? You know, Peter said in one of his epistles that there would be scoffers and mockers in the last day saying, where is the promise of his coming? I'm about ready to read <laughs> a fulfillment of their question tonight. And um, Revelation, the book of Revelation has been intense. It always is every year that I read it. It just seems like the longer we go on, the more, the deeper the meaning gets to me anyway, personally, and how we're experiencing and seeing all of these things and we're reading it. Um, you know, I, I wanna make a distinction between people that believe in the Bible and people that don't believe the Bible. There's a lot of you who have taken a stand for Jesus and you're not going to watch the woke Olympics. <laughs> okay, as an example, just like me, I'm not watching the woke Olympics either. I see controversial news articles about it, stupid things that are going on, etc. Um, good to see you, Betty. Thank you very much for coming on. I see Lydia came on. Thank you very much, ladies. It'll start filling up here in a few minutes. I'll get some more of the audience coming in. So there's different groups of people in the world, and, and there is like this small remnant of people that read and understand what they're seeing in the scriptures and how it's all coming to pass right now. What can I compare that to today? What do you think I could compare that to? I had this thought before I came on. You remember at the Trump rally at Butler, Pennsylvania, where you had these some of these people that were standing outside of the event um, and they were pointing to the shooter on the roof and he's doing a bear crawl and he's, they're yelling at the police and the police are just like, duh, just ignoring them. You know, a, a lot of the truth is starting to come out on, in this <laughs> investigation where we're, we're learning things that we didn't know before. Like some of these secret service knew what was going on be like, you know, I don't know how many minutes before um, they actually decided to shoot this guy. You know, obviously they should never let Trump on the stage, but my point is, is that you have this group of people that's paying attention to danger. They're very alert, they're very astute. They're watching what's going on. And we don't want to be under this false pretense that everybody else is seeing the danger that you and I are seeing, okay? And the police that were walking around with their stupid hats on, we're literally doing nothing ignoring the danger that the crowd was trying to alert them to. That reminds me <laughs> of these Bible studies. How we are studying and we see how accurate scripture is and the rest of the world is not paying attention. They're watching the woke Olympics. You know, I seen this, um, I seen a post on Facebook the other day. It was like a, an event that I didn't even know existed. It was some type of four man rowing boat competition that we hadn't received, never received a medal in. And, and it says, oh, we got a medal in this event. And I looked at the endless comments in the uh, Facebook post and everybody's going, oh, isn't that wonderful? Oh yeah, that's great. Wonderful, wonderful. USA, 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 you know? And I'm thinking to myself, these are the type of people that are not paying attention to what the dangers of the world, the things that are going on. By the way, 
that's going to affect every single person on the face of the earth. Whether you're raptured off of this earth, Jesus comes for the bride, or these people that get left behind, it's going to affect everybody. So who are the people that are in the know? Who are the ones like those uh, Make America Great Again fans that were watching that shooter on the roof? Who are the people that you can, you know, tune in with, with me exactly, and know what's going on? Well, I have a Bible open on my laptop this evening, and the scriptures are telling us the dangers that we are facing in this world, what's getting ready to happen. Um, and I wanna show you something very up to date before I, I launch into Revelation 19. Revelation 19 is incredible, by the way. I'll, it won't take me long, but I'm gonna show you some up-to-date scriptures that I, I don't know if anybody's seen this before. I've kind of touted this a few times uh, at some different ministries and some social media posts, but for the most part, I don't know that anybody gets it, but I'm gonna share it with you right now. This is, does it make me special? Not, not as far, <laughs> without the word of God, I'm nothing, okay? Um, but since I'm studying and the Lord's showing me, I get to share it with you all. Good to see you, Rebecca. Um, I'm glad that you're on live with me this evening and um, everyone else that comes on live. I'm always grateful to everybody. I sincerely mean that and I really respect all of your time. Everybody that comes on, I really do because um, the goal is to reach people for Jesus with the time that we have left. That's really the bottom line of why I do this. And I'll, obviously to edify the church. That's what we're, that's what I'm here for, you know, to do this with you all. And there are some, I know that a lot of you out there are hungry for the word of God like I am. And when you taste and see how good that the word of God is, you want more. And, um, Sometimes we get fleshy and lazy and things like that, but when you start getting into it, it's like nothing you've ever experienced before, how God will talk to you through the scripture. And there. Um, okay, Lydia. Thank you, uh, Rebecca. Yeah, that, uh, that painting was um, put together for me in, a, um, in Thailand. There was an artist in Thailand that made that for me. And um, uh, this was when my mom passed away and... Uh, and I was really wanting to do, I just was heavy on my heart about having a, a picture of Jesus painted and, um, and my parents painted. So that was what I wanted to do. Um, and so I thought, yeah, that's a really, it's an all oil paint too. Can you imagine that? You know how expensive that would be? It was a few hundred dollars for me in Thailand. This artist, the reason why I chose him over all the other ones, there was, <laughs> my dad was an artist, okay? And he used to tell me that there was a lot of, great artists that literally are broke. <laughs> they don't make money, but they're great, you know? Well, this guy had this particular talent for faces. And I really liked his work when I saw the faces. And I was like, okay, this is my man right here. And I interviewed him and he asked, and he inter interviewed me and he asked me a bunch of questions. And I said, yeah, I want you to take your time on this one for me, okay? And he was very respectful. So that's a short story behind the painting. So. Um, and guess who, guess who we're talking about tonight, right? Jesus, we're talking about his literal physical return. And I wanna get you all excited about that. I really do because if you are in the know, if you're paying attention, your redemption is near. It's not drawing near, it is near. Let's get into this. Psalm 83 verses three through five, okay? I am in Revelation 19 tonight, but I'm giving you a couple of scriptures that I wanna show you how close we are to going home. Now, we know that this whole um, thing that's going on in the Middle East, which is not making like headlines, the Woke Olympics is making headlines and, and Kamala Harris is making headlines and Trump is making headlines. But the, the, the war in the Middle East is taking a back seat in Babylon, <laughs> all right? Taking a back seat in Babylon, you know, but that should be, honestly, if I was controlling the media, you know what I would have splattered all over the front page? Hey, 
this is what's going on in Israel right now. The Iron Dome in Israel, by the way, wow, man, that thing is incredible. It's taking out all those rockets from Hezbollah. Um, we are witnessing, we are witnessing, I want to say the initial stages of the Psalm 83, what's described the 83. There's a lot of Christians that say the war in Psalm 83. And to me, I'm absolutely convinced this is the initial stages of Psalm 83. And let, how about we let David tell us instead of me trying to tell you, um, I think you all should believe it because I think so. Let's let David tell us, okay? Um, they have taken crafty counsel against thy people, that's Israel, and consulted against thy hidden ones. Full stop for one second. You know, you know who I think the hidden ones are? I think those are the hostages that Hamas has taken. I think those are the hostages in verse three. Why do I think that? If this is the Psalm 83 war that I think it is, then this would make perfect sense. That's why I think that. They have said, come, come, all of Hamas, Iran, um, you know, Turkey, um, Lebanon, etc., even Iraq and Afghanistan and all of them, they have said, come, let us cut them off from being a nation. And we have um, dumbbells in our country that say the same thing, that are it actually our lead, some of our leaders are saying the same thing, right? Let us cut them off. Let us cut Israel off from being a nation that the name of Israel be may, may be of no more in remembrance. What is that famous thing they like to say where uh, they want to they push Israel into the ocean, into the sea? For they have consulted together with one consent and they are confederate against thee. If this is a description, uh, this, this war and this uh, mindset is a description of what we are seeing right, right now that's going on and I have no reason to believe it's not then we're really close. We're really close for everything to be, um, for the church to be removed off of this earth. And I'm not telling you it's today, tomorrow, or anything like that. But what I am telling you is you and I are in the middle of an action-packed movie. We're, we're, we're not watching the movie, we're in the movie. <laughs> Scripture is describing our um, scenario, our scene right now, okay? And I've told people, and I've had, what, five, six Bible studies about Babylon, building a case for Babylon. Revelation 19, we're gonna to touch a little bit, um, some finishing touches on Babylon tonight. And I hope when we're done with Revelation 19, you'll kind of have a conclusion about why. I believe that, um, I wanna say, here's what I wanna say, okay? That spirit of Babylon has been around for a very long time, all the way back to Nimrod and the Tower of Babel, okay? So the spirit of, of Babylon has uh, outposts, Satan's demonic hordes, okay? Ephesians chapter six, powers, principalities, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places, has garrisons and outposts set up in our country right now. And we saw in Revelation 18, just the other day, how that all of that was, was taken out. The Lord himself came and dealt with Babylon and it said that it was a habitation of devils, okay? It didn't say that it was a habitation of people that have devils in them, which, you know, that's part of it, but no, it's literally, literally devils that are set up in Babylon, okay? So the spirit of that, of that Babylon, we're talking about um, that uh, idol that they were worshiping in Babylon a long time ago and Egypt adopted it and um, uh, King Ahab adopted it in Israel. Uh, Rome adopted it, okay? And um, it's that goddess Asera, okay? Ishtar, I'm sorry, Ishtar. They they renamed it Asera um, in, um, what was it? I think it was in Babylon. They, they renamed it, but Ishtar was the original um, spirit that they were worshiping. And Ishtar was about freedom, freedom to sin, freedom to do whatever you want to do. 
Does that sound familiar to a lot of you out there? Freedom to do whatever you want. You have people pretending to be Christians that think, oh, I can take my freedom and I can sin. I can be a LGBTQ. I can be this. I can be that. I can have an abortion because I'm free, free, free. You know, that's not what freedom in Christ is all about at all. No, it's the freedom that we have as born again, Bible believing Christians is that when we make a mistake, we are covered by the blood of Jesus and we are always striving to be our best. We hate sin, okay? There are people out there that love sin. They, they think it's freedom and this is what that spirit of Ishtar is all about and has been about for a very long time. So Psalm 83, where you are, I am, I am very convinced we're in the initial stages and what really blows me away about this chapter is that it says that these enemies of Israel have taken a crafty counsel against the people, against thy people Israel and against thy hidden ones. It's the, it's the hostages. This is, I mean, like, again, like I say, if, if we are seeing the initial stages of the Psalm 83 prophecy, then obviously that would make a lot of sense to a lot of people. It's not going to take us long to find out. <laughs> Um, good to see you, Annie. Thank you very much for coming on. I really appreciate it. We have a few people on. Okay. So I gave you Psalm 83, and I think there's a lot of Christians in the community that are watching and paying attention that are going to agree with me and agree with maybe some of you that think the same way. It's like, all right, we're seeing this. Are we really that close to be removed off of the earth? Yeah, we are. I'm not giving you a day and an hour, but we're the fig tree generation. All right. Israel's rebirth is 74 years old. I've said this many times in Psalm 90.10. A generation is about 70 to 80 years. And then in Psalm 90.10, you know what it says? And then we fly away. <laughs> yeah, the Bible is full of clues, full of clues. Let me take you over to one more. I'm gonna take you over to one more. This is another updated scripture that I see happening right now, okay? And then we'll go to Revelation 19 and we'll start getting into that a little bit. Watch this, okay? There is a prophecy here in Jeremiah 51 against Babylon, against Babylon, okay? And people are gonna say, well, that's the Babylon of the Old Testament. And I'm gonna tell them, you're very short-sighted, okay? because God replays things in history. Like, let me give you an example of something that might stick with some of you when we look at, um, let's just say the Babylon of the past and this mystery Babylon in Revelation 18, okay? Obviously the mystery Babylon in 17 is not that Old Testament Babylon. It's been gone for a long time, right? But let's just say as an example, Remember in Genesis chapter six, how these sons of God came down and took the women that they liked, okay? And they, they broke God's law and it says in the book of Jude that they're in chains right now, but they, they came down and they polluted the human race. And this is why um, in Noah's generation, God destroyed every, every living thing on the face of the earth save a, a family of eight and animals because of the, the corruption. So the analogy that I'm trying to drive home is that the same thing is um, happening all over again with these wicked spirits. So you see, something that happened in the past is happening all over again. Um, and uh, I mean, I could give you evidence of that on and on and on, but I'm just trying to help you grasp that it, we're wrestling with spirits, we're wrestling you know, Paul says that we wrestle not with flesh and blood. We're not wrestling per se with people. We're wrestling with these spirits and they're always around, you know? Um, it's been prophesied, Annie. Babylon is going to fall. And what a terrible fall it was. We read that the other day in, in 18. Terrible fall. But watch this. Okay, you ready for an update? Let me give you an update of this Babylon and look. I'm not gonna to pretend to tell you it's not concealed. This is a concealed passage of scripture and it's only gonna be for people that really have their thinking cap on and have a um, 
a relative amount of, of spiritual discernment, okay? Because um, what's happened in the past will happen again, okay? So God is telling a story oftentimes in the, um, of what happened in the past, but it's also going to be something that's gonna happen in the future. So let, let me read to you Jeremiah 51, 11, then we'll get on over to Revelation 19, okay? This is what it says in 51, 11 of, of uh, Jeremiah I'm going to read it, then I'm going to break it down. It's not long. Make bright the arrows, gather the shields. The Lord hath raised up the spirit, the spirit of the kings of the Medes. For his device is against Babylon to destroy it because it is the vengeance of the Lord, the vengeance of his temple, the temple in heaven. I'm going to break it down for you now. We know in history, and the Bible tells us, that the Old Testament Babylon was, dis the Medes came, and um, when um, it was um, uh, Belshazzar, okay, was Belshazzar. He was, uh, he was the Babylonian king. He was, um, he was Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, and what he did, Daniel was an old man at this time, and he was he brought in all the temple treasury of, of Israel, okay? And they were mocking the God of Israel. And what happened was there was this, you remember the old saying, the writing on the wall, right? The writing is on the wall. Where do we get that saying from? Because this hand that didn't have an arm attached to it started writing this mysterious encrypted message on, on the wall when they were all busy getting drunk. Okay, and they were mocking God. Do we have God mockers in, in our country right now? Yeah, we do, don't we, huh? Well, guess what I'm doing? I'm doing what the spirit of Daniel was doing. We're, right, we're reading God's words right now, and it's encrypted, and people don't know because they're too busy hating on God. They don't understand, but you will understand. And he says, I'm talking about Babylon of our time, money, stock market, Rothschild, etc. Amen. Annie, I'm... I'm with you. I'm right with you on that. Um, what I'm doing is um, I'm just saying before I, I give you this analogy here is that this Old Testament Babylon was busy mocking the God of the Bible, mocking Israel. And this weird <laughs> open vision, they were probably all thought they were really drunk on wine, you know, whatever they were drinking. Maybe they were on something else too, but um but they saw this writing on the wall and they couldn't interpret it. And then they bring Daniel and the king brings in Daniel because this one of their magicians says, oh, this man's been around a long time. He knows how to interpret cryptic and mysterious things. Okay, so they bring Daniel in and the king says, I'm gonna give you um, a lot of wealth if you can, you can interpret this. And, and Daniel says, no need for that. You don't need to, you don't need to give me any wealth, but I'm going to and translate it for you because Daniel knew that um, Belshazzar's time was up. So the writing on the wall, and I'm going to get all into a big with it, into a very deep discussion about this, but basically the writing was on the wall that Babylon's time was up. Okay, what's happened in the past will happen again, nothing new under the sun. So that very night, the Medes came in. Where are the Medes from? They're from Persia. The Medes came in and they defeated Babylon before they ever knew what hit them. But it was a military conquest with people. With It was another nation, okay? It was another nation that did this. And they defeated Babylon, okay? Hang on to your hat. Let me break this down for you because I think this is going to be... Let me say, Lord, give me the right words to say when I break this down because I have the analogy in my mind. I just hope that I can express this analogy to you all um, to where you it resonates with you. That's my goal, okay? So this is something that happened in the past, okay? Did you know that this very same thing is happening right now as I speak? There is a prophecy in Isaiah where it said, and I read this in the uh, Bible study the other day about how... Um, it was about Ethiopia. It was uh, it was a it was a nation that was 
uh, beyond the seas of Ethiopia, okay, this was Babylon, that they brought their ambassadors out, okay? And it said that they had the wings. And so this is, to me, was describing um, like our Navy going out to this area to patrol and to be an ambassador to keep the peace, supposedly, in the Middle East. I should probably bring, bring that scripture up for you, but if you want if you want that, let me know. I'll give it to you to, because it, it ties into this right here, okay? So the Medes are, where are the Medes are from? They're from Persia, and where um, Persia used to be, um, where uh, modern-day Iran is now. It was changed around, I want to say, in the 1940s. It used to be called Persia, but then it was changed to, ba I'm sorry, changed to Iran in the 1940s. They changed the name. So it's the location that we have to pay attention to here. Thank you very much, George. Good to see you, brother. I'm glad that you're here. We're knee deep into it right now, okay? We're knee deep. <laughs> I read Jeremiah 51 11. And for George, let me write, read this for George one more time, if y'all don't mind. Make bright the arrows, gather the shields. The Lord hath raised up the spirit of the kings of the Medes, for his device is against Babylon to destroy it because it is the vengeance of the Lord, the vengeance of his temple. Well, this is something that happened in the past, but it's happening as I speak right now all over again. But this time, the Medes are called the Iranians. They're called the Iranians. And what is it that God says he's doing with the Medes here, the Iranians? He is stirring their spirit up, okay? He's stirring up their spirit. And what is, it, what is, what is this whole thing about? It's this Psalm 83 war, okay? He's stirring in, what does it say? Make bright the arrows, gather the shields. I was looking at the Iron Dome in action the other day, and the Iron Dome looked like the 4th of July. It just like, I'm talking fireworks, and it was knocking out all those rockets, but I mean, it looked like you could just sit down in your backyard and, and watch that at night. It was an incredible sight. You can go on X, you can go on Facebook, you can go on YouTube and watch. It's probably happening as I speak right now. Make bright the arrows. Gather the shields. Who is, <clears throat> I know it's Hezbollah, but who has been su supplying Hezbollah with all of their weapons? It's been the Medes. It's been Iran. But why is God allowing this to happen to Israel right now because his device is against Babylon. He is stirring up the Medes, he is stirring up the Iranians against his people Israel because his purpose is, is for, it's against this modern day Babylon that we're reading about. Okay, I'm talking about the future now, not from the past. I'm talking about a literal translation that God has plans against this future Babylon. To what? Destroy it. Because the vengeance of the Lord, the vengeance of his temple. So where are we going? Why, why would modern day Iran and Iran attacking Israel be in God's plans to destroy modern day Babylon? It's very simple. Because what's going to come out of this conflict that we are seeing happening, that's very important for us, we should all be paying attention to, is there's going to be a peace deal and I wanna say, I'm not even talking about Daniel 9.27 with the Antichrist. I'm talking about something initially that causes the land of Israel to get divided. I'm talking about, um, I'm talking about the Abraham Accords and I'm talking about giving the Palestinians a state. And that is part of the, this is, we're seeing, we're in a movie, okay? We're in a movie, this is an action-packed movie that you and I are not just watching, but we're involved in it, we're watching it. <laughs> we're living in Babylon, okay? So we're part of the movie. For his device is against Babylon. What, what device is this? What is this device? This device is, is setting up, right? When you set a trap for somebody, um, especially stupid people, it's really easy for them to walk right into the trap and get caught. And God is setting up a trap for Babylon right now, okay? What is the trap? The trap is you divide my land, you die. You, you attempt, I, let me correct myself, you attempt to divide my land, you attempt to give Jerusalem to the Palestinians, you're signing a death warrant. 
there, and I said to the other audience the other day in the other Bible study in Revelation, in 18 when we were in it, I, I was telling you that God has a decree against Babylon. And when there's a decree set in heaven, nothing's going to change the decree, okay? Could repentance change the decree? Well, um, let's just say, um, yes, it could. But when a decree is set, they're not going to repent. Repentance is not on the table when a decree has been set in heaven because they're not going to repent. They're going to keep going forward until they get destroyed. Look at these, look at the, the wickedness that we have in our country today. I think, I don't need to explain, I don't need to share a bunch of articles with you all about all this. You know, you know yourself, you know very well. So I'm saying that we're in the middle of this thing, we're watching it happen, we're watching God's mysterious work play out right before our very eyes. So. This was the two notations that I wanted to give you. Jeremiah 51, 11, um, which I felt was really, really uh, good. And Jeremiah 51, I'm sorry, not Jeremiah. Jeremiah 51, 11, and then Psalm 83, okay? Those are the two that I wanted to highlight for you that was like an update right now that we're seeing play out right before our very eyes, okay? So now let's look to the future. Let's go to Revelation 19, 11. And this is really incredible. You want to know what's more incredible? This whole thing with Babylon that I'm talking about, it's covered in Revelation 16. Babylon is covered in Revelation 16. It's covered in uh, Revelation 17 and 18. And it's even covered in 19. Four chapters in the book of Revelation that Babylon is, is a part of. So how important is this that we're looking at? It's very important. Um, let me read your comment, George. I'm gonna do it on my phone, if that's okay. Let me see. Um, and then we're gonna read down on this and then we'll be pretty much done, okay? Okay. Um, George says, um, it seems Netanyahu might have to be removed, I think, for the land to be divided since he's strong Israel. Maybe I'm wrong though. You know what? Um, the Lord hasn't told me one way or the other, George, except that there's clues in the Bible. Um, let me just say this. Let's, let's entertain that idea for one minute before I read Revelation 19, because why, why should we be? Because this is very important <laughs> for everybody. This, everything that's happening over there is world changing for everybody on the face of the earth. So we, let's talk about it for a second. Let's just say that Netanyahu's not going anywhere for a while. Let's just entertain that idea for a second, okay? Well, if Trump wins, I think he's gonna win. If he doesn't, he doesn't. Then God's gonna fulfill his device against Babylon through Kamala Harris, okay? But let's say that Trump wins. Well, guess what? Those two get along very well. In fact, they were about this close to um, the Abraham Accords being finished until COVID hit us all, okay? And Trump got pushed off to the side for a while, for four years, and we've seen how bad everything's been for us since. So could Trump get reelected to finish the Abraham Accords? That's the big question. Well, if Netanyahu is in there, okay, I had mentioned earlier this year that the only way that Israel would make a deal with someone like Netanyahu as prime minister is that they would have to have the initial threat disarmed on their borders at least for that to happen, okay? Who's capable, who is capable of shake, rattle, and roll, man? It's Trump, okay? I think you could calm that stuff down over there. Is that spirit of Antichrist going away? No. But I think some catastrophic mistakes will be made with uh, a Palestinian state being created, no matter who the US president is. In fact, the Bible seems to indicate, I wanna say during the destruction of Babylon, when you read Jeremiah chapter uh, 50, okay? Jeremiah chapter 50, there is, the king of Babylon is referred to as a man. The king of Babylon is terrified, doesn't know what to do during this destruction, okay? And so when I read that, that's not a woman, that's not Kamala Harris, that's a man, okay? So it's a hint. I don't, like I said, you know, we gotta, we just gotta kind of, 
look at these clues in scripture and just marinate on it a little bit, okay? So um, now to bring up your point, George, about Netanyahu being removed eventually, he's an old man and eventually he will be, he will be gone. He will, he, he's, it's all about his legacy at, at this point, okay? His legacy, if he was to get peace in the Middle East, which was his dream, he was very giddy about that when Trump was president, he thought, wow, I'm, I'm so close to having peace for Israel. And then COVID hit and all those crazy things happened. Um, so his legacy, he would like to have peace. He would like to have a peace deal. But if he's gone, if he gets removed, we know that in Isaiah, I believe it's uh, chapter 66, a covenant with death and hell, that Israel is called scornful people in their leader list, okay? Um, uh, let me, let me just give you that really fast. Uh, it's Isaiah 28, 14. <clears throat> Would y'all like me to read that before I read Revelation 19? I know I'm rabbit trailing a little bit, but <clears throat> you know, all of this is, we're talking about very serious stuff here tonight. This is. Nothing could be more serious than the second coming of Jesus, right? That's, a, that's I, I have some things to say about that too, but we're kind of in the middle of this whole thing that's happening in the fig tree generation. And it's just fascinating for me to watch, watch play out. Okay, this is um, Isaiah 28, 14. Um, it says, okay. Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men that rule this people which is in Jerusalem, okay? Where is the U.S. Embassy today? It's in Jerusalem, guys. Right? So we know that Israel's focal point is Jerusalem. The whole world is a cup of trembling because of Jerusalem right now. Because ye have said, and God is talking to his people right now, this is future tense, not right now, but it's in the future. We have made a covenant with death. And with hell we are at agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us, for we have made lies our refuge, and under false good we have hid ourselves. Um, so it's leaderless, George. In the future, um, this group of people that's leading Israel for the Daniel 9, 27. Um, oh goodness, okay. Daniel 9.27 is a covenant that the Antichrist comes along and he makes adjustments. It's one that's already on the table. It, it, it isn't, because a lot of people think that the Antichrist will create a covenant with Israel, but no, there's a covenant that's already been created and he is just adjusting it to what he, how he wants it to be. So I'm thoroughly convinced, like a lot of other Christians that are watching and studying, is that these Abraham Accords are it. And, all, and what has to happen if we're that close to leaving is that these accords have to be completed, okay? So just to entertain the idea that um, would Netanyahu not be involved in this thing with the Antichrist, I think that's highly likely. It's highly likely that Netanyahu will not be signing no deal with the Antichrist. But would he sign a deal with Donald Trump? under assurances of protection and security and wealth and yeah, of course. Could Kamala Harris be the one to do that? I, I mean, you know, God's performing a strange work right now that says that in the Bible. That would really be a strange work to see him install Kamala Harris to, to work with Israel, I'm just telling you. That would be really fascinating for me to watch. I'm not ruling it out, okay? I just want people to say I'm not a Old Testament prophet. There is no Old Testament prophets in the church age. What we do is we study the word of God and we ask God to help us interpret what we're seeing. And we get dreams and visions sometimes, yes. But I'm looking at this as a student and it makes more sense for me if we're that close to going home that Trump would be the president in the future to finish that accord. So let's look at Revelation 19, okay? Let's take a look. The destruction of Babylon is complete in Revelation 18. And John says, after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, 
Hallelujah. Salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. Salvation, never forget how important our salvation is. It's extremely important. We're very happy not only to be in heaven, but we're happy that this Babylon has been judged. For true and righteous are his judgments, for the, he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. I'm going to mention that. It's mentioned more than once, but I'm going to double back on that in a second about these blood of the servants thing going on here, okay? And again, they said, hallelujah, and her smoke rose up forever and forever. That means the wicked spirits of Babylon, the evil people that were ruling in Babylon and every, every other person that hated Jesus Christ, lost people, their smoke is gonna rise up forever and forever. And the four and 24 elders and, and the four beasts that are around the throne of God, they fell down and worshiped God that sat on the throne saying, amen and hallelujah. And a voice came out of the throne saying, praise our God, all ye servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage supper of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. What an amazing moment that's going to be. And to her it was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb, and he say, saith unto me, these are true, the true sayings of God. Why do, why do I oftentimes have invitations to come to Jesus in these Bible studies? Because it's very important. It says it right here. It's very important. You're blessed if you're called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Unsaved people don't get to go to this wedding, okay? We, we one, once upon a time, I read that parable about Jesus saying uh, a parable about how um, the master was throwing a wedding for his son and all the invitations went out. Nobody, nobody wanted to come. His brethren didn't want to come. They just ignored it. They ignored the invitation. And the master, the father, was so angry. He says, okay, servants, go out and invite anybody that'll come in. And then the room was filled with people. He went out into the highways and to the byways but his own brethren rejected the, the invitation. They ignored it, you know, like, so I mentioned that because like they don't understand how important it is to be uh, saved, coming to Jesus, having a knowledge of him and accepting what he did for them on the cross. That's why, I mean, obviously not enough people give that invitation at church and uh, or on a YouTube channel that, that supposedly has a ministry. I've heard people give you news article after news article and we're really close and oh, Ram's gonna get ready to hit Israel. And, and then when they get to the salvation message, they're like, they read 1 Corinthians um, 15 verses one through four really fast. Uh, Christ died and shed his blood for us and blah, 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 really fast. And it sounded very insincere, insincere, you know? And I'm like, dude, slow down. Like, you know, you're, you're giving everybody all of this anxiety and everything and, and they really don't know what to do about all this information you're sharing with them. And then you wanna go over the salvation message really fast? No, slow down and let them know why it's so important. Right here that I just read to you, being at the marriage supper of the lamb is very important. <laughs> you wanna go there. You don't wanna be the, have smoke ascending off of you forever and forever. You wanna go to heaven. Now, this is, I love this one here. Okay? Verse 10 is amazing to me because people, have a tendency to worship other people. They have a tendency to worship angels and everybody but Jesus, okay? That's literally a fact. I've seen that in my own life. And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he saith unto me, see that thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and thy, uh, and thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. 
for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Why is it that we have the book of Revelation? Because of Jesus, right? That is the spirit of prophecy. By the way, uh, what does it say in, in uh, the Gospel of John chapter uh, 1, verse 1? In the beginning was the Word, the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Hold on to that thought for a second. Watch when we get down a little further here. This is my favorite verse. I don't want to say that it's my favorite verse, but I love this one, okay? They're all, I mean, whatever God touches me with in Scripture is my favorite verse of the day, but check this one out. And I saw heaven open. Hey, scoffers, pay attention, mockers and scoffers. Behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. I've had people tell me, oh, the... There's going to be people that, you know, like tribulation saints, the ones that are still alive, didn't take the mark of the beast or whatever. They're, look, everybody is going to be terrified, even if they're hanging on for Jesus, right? When he comes in this fashion, look, John was on the island of Patmos and he fell like over like a dead man when he saw Jesus in his glorified form, okay? I'm just saying. This is not the Jesus that the church is looking forward to right here, Okay. Um, we're riding with him. We're coming back with him. This is the Jesus that's making war on the world that hates him. His eyes were as a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. God bless you this evening, Betty. No problem. I'm really happy that you're here. You, you were here as long as you were. It's great. Um, and I'll see you on the next Bible study. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and his name was called the word of God. Remember I told you to hang on to that John 1, chapter 1, verse 1 and following. Who is Jesus on the horse? The word of God. And he became flesh and dwelt among us. I love rightly dividing, don't you? And the armies, the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses. Did you know you've got a white horse in your future? clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth go a sharp sword. With it, he should smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Do you love God's word? Do you love his righteousness? Do you, do you, or do you like fraudulent elections? Do you like eating cricket flour? Do you like um, tyrants ruling over you? Do you like people like Kamala Harris and Joe Biden? I didn't think so, neither do I. We're going to have the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords ruling in righteousness. And we get to be a part of that administration. He treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Why is it on his thigh? You know, the prayer shawl has tassels. And the tassels, when a Jewish man wears them, those tassels um, are the names of God. They're supposed to be the names of God and, and the word of God those tassels represent. And so if somebody's wearing a shawl, a Jewish prayer shawl, those tassels are hanging over your legs. And it's, it looks to me like Jesus is wearing that on the white horse. And I saw an angel standing <clears throat> in the sun and he cried with a loud voice. You know, sun, the sun is very hot, by the way. <laughs> very hot. Cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, that's the birds, come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of tyrants. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's just my word. The flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them the flesh of all men, both free and bond, small and great, because there is a lot of God haters in the world and they didn't repent even when God was pouring out those bold judgments, giving them an opportunity to repent and they wouldn't do it. Too bad for them. It's really sad for them, but this is their recompense, okay? And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war 
against him that sat on the horse and against his army. You know, I was standing on that very location where this battle is going to happen. Just over a year ago, I was standing on Megiddo, Armageddon. And I saw um, Mount Tabor off at a distance. I'll send you all that picture someday if you wanna see it. Tabor is where Jesus climbed the mountain with, um, I believe it was Peter and James and John or Andrew went up to the mountain and that's where the transfiguration happened where Moses and Elijah appeared with Jesus on the mountain. And I could see that at Megiddo. I, was, I didn't know it was that close. And my guide was telling me, yeah, the, Jew, the um, archeologists have determined that this has gotta be the mountain because uh, geographically speaking, uh, they were looking at other mountains that were in the area. There's not a lot over there, to be honest with you in this one particular spot. So they're pretty sure based on archeology span that that's Mount Tabor where Jesus ascended up with the disciples. It's pretty cool. But I was on this battlefield and I was looking out over Naboth's vineyard and I could see this perfect battlefield for this description right here. And it's like, wow, man. And I, my guide asked me when I was in Israel, I was like, where do you want to go? I said, I wish I was here for a month or two months because I need the time. Oh, there's a, so many places I want to go. But I said, I'll go, I'll, can I go to Megiddo? And he said, yeah, I can take you there. Let's go to the Sea of Galilee. And I went there. That was amazing. Let's continue. We're almost done with this chapter. The beast was taken with him, the false prophet who wrought the miracles before him. So... The demise of the beast and the false prophet are going to happen at the same time, okay? They're both gonna be alive. They're both trying to make war against Jesus and the armies of heaven. They're gonna be taken alive. Um, they deceived everybody on the earth that had the mark of the beast and them that worshiped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with a sword of him that sat upon the horse, which the sword proceeded out of his mouth and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. So the birds are gonna have this great big feast. We're gonna have a big feast at the marriage supper of the lamb and then we get to come back, be involved in this very short lived battle and the birds are gonna be eating the flesh of all of God's enemies. Um, let me show you something really amazing before I let you go. Okay. I love scripture. One second. Let me take you over to Isaiah 63, three, okay? Isaiah 63, three. So we just read that, um, Jesus comes back, right? And we read the description of what he looks like on the white horse. And he's got blood on him, okay? A lot of people have thought to themselves, well, that's because, you know, he shed his blood on the cross, right? Um, that he has the blood on, on his vesture. But I, I, I wanna submit to you that during the seven year tribulation, he has the blood of his enemies on him. He has the blood of his enemies on him, you know, he doesn't just sit in heaven during the seven year tribulation and let all the angels go and do all of his bidding. That is happening, but he's not, he is, look, the Bible in the book of Genesis, when Moses uh, wrote down, you know, um, when they were rescued by God through, through out of Egypt, he said, God is a man of war. So he is not going to just sit idly by and let the angels do all do it all. He's going to be involved in this, what's happening in the seven year tribulation. I'm gonna read something to you very am amazing in Isaiah 63, three. We will do that, George. We will definitely do that. Um, I'm almost done actually. So uh, let me read this and then we'll do the, just what, what you suggested there. I have trodden the wine press alone. What is that wine press that we read about that's the wine press of those 21 judgments that we read in Revelation, especially those bowl judgments at the very end. It's a wine press. And he says, I have trodden the wine press alone, Isaiah 66, three. And of the people, there was none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury. 
and their blood shall be sprinkled on my garments and I will stain all of my raiment. Now, does that description in Revelation 19 about how Jesus looked makes a little more sense now? It does to me. It does to me. The word of God's incredible, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so let me do this, okay, as we close. I'm gonna look at uh, George's full statement here, a prayer request. Okay. Um, second here, George. Can we get a prayer before we finish? The, the kids are all going back to school this year, protection and proper learning. Yes, absolutely, George, okay. So let's start with that, shall we? Lord, I wanna thank you for this Bible study this evening. Thank you for giving me the ability and the time and the resources to come on and share with everybody here on social media, the silent majority that don't say anything. It's fine. I'm happy that they just came on and listened to us, Lord. And, and hopefully they are finished with a little more knowledge than before they came on. I want to pray not only for George's children, but all of the other children, Lord, that you love and care so much about the reason why your fierce judgment is coming on our country, especially how they have, we have uh, in our nation been guilty of doing terrible things to children. Not only in our country, Lord, but in, in all of the other countries too. And I've, I've heard stories, I've seen things. I wanna pray for your supernatural protection, Lord, over the kids in, in our country. And, and obviously in around the world too. But I wanna pray, Lord, that they, your hedge of protection is over them, that you give them discernment. When they hear something from their teacher that doesn't sound right, they're going to reject it because your spirit is telling them, no, this is not right. This is wrong. Give them courage. Give them the ability to discern right and wrong. Um, and I know not everybody can afford private school. It's very expensive. I pray that the parents will be more involved in their children's activities at school also, Lord. Don't leave them to the wolves. I pray that the parents, Lord, will be heightened to the protection of their kids and what they're learning. Not only with that, but everything else that happens in school too. Drugs and um, teachers trying to have the kids, kids taken to clinics and stuff without the parents' permission. It's all coming to a head, Lord. It's all coming to a head. But I pray, I pray that your will be done. I pray for their protection in this new year, this new school year that's getting ready to start back up. Um, Lydia says, my boy will be starting the sixth grade. You know, it's amazing. I remember the sixth grade. <laughs> Lydia, a long time ago, I remember the sixth grade. I was like, wow, I'm growing up fast. I'm already in the sixth grade, you know? And I played sports and I was in boxing and... And I, I was having a lot of fun back then. It was great. I thought, oh, I can't wait to graduate so I can get out of school. Kind of wishing I was back in school again, you know, all this responsibility and everything. Um, but I'm sorry to, to rabbit trail on that. But anyway, I, I do, Lord, I want to pray for their protection, obviously. And give them, Lord, plant seeds of scriptures in these kids like you did to me when I was a kid, Lord. I, I had seeds planted in me when I was young and it bore fruit. And I pray that for these kids too, Lord. And um, I don't want your word just to be for old people, Lord. I want it to be for a new generation that's hungry for you. It's not stopping with us, Lord. I want this to be passed on to the next generation. Help them to be ready, Lord. Help them to witness to their friends without feeling embarrassed about it. There's nothing to be embarrassed about. Siding with evil is always wrong. The cool thing is, the amazing thing is, is having a relationship with you, Lord. And, and when people understand how incredible that is, they'll never go back when they're born again. I pray for people that are not saved. I, pay, I pray for people that don't know Jesus tonight. And I hope that you got through all of this. If you didn't, it's okay. But I'm praying for you as well, that you will make a confession to Jesus tonight. It's super easy, super easy. I'm a sinner. I've made mistakes. 
if there's anybody walking around that thinks they're perfect, you're deluded, you're delusional. I know transgenders in boxing in the Olympics right now that are delusional. They're getting all excited about beating up women and uh, they're delusional. They're, they're living a lie. Living a lie is thinking that you have done nothing wrong and we have all done wrong. We've all lied. We've all thought evil things. We've all done things that we need forgiveness for. And I've had people tell me, oh, I'm a good person. I'm a good person. Do you think you're a good person? Really? Have you ever told any lies before? Have you ever looked upon a woman with lust before? Have you ever gotten drunk before? Have you ever taken God's name in vain before? Have you ever hated anybody before? Hating, Jesus said, uh, hating is the same thing as murder. Now we're starting to look at God's standards of righteousness. And, and, and guess what? Nobody on this planet can escape, can escape, um, that day when we all have to stand before the Lord. If we have Jesus as our defense attorney, our sins are covered. If you stand before God without him, you are going to have every single thought, word, deed played back to you because he's righteous. And then they're gonna open books and your name is not going to be in the book of life and you have nowhere to go. So you get to go where the devil's going, okay? Don't let that happen to you. You've got an opportunity right now to come to Jesus. And if you need help with that, if you need prayer with that, let us know. We have some moderators in here that would be more than happy to help you beside me, but I'll be do it with you if you want me to. No problem. I'll watch my messengers tonight. You message me, okay? If you need help with your salvation, and listen, if you're a Christian out there and thinking you can lose your salvation, message me about that too, because the Bible makes it abundantly clear that you have been sealed for the day of redemption. You cannot be unsealed when you're sealed. You're in, you have entered into a blood covenant with God through Jesus Christ. And it's only dependent on God's faithfulness, not yours. So he won't break it, understand? He won't break it. That's why I can be so bold and do what I do right here because if I trip, if I stumble, if I make a mistake, if I don't get a scripture exactly right or if I trip over a word, God knows what I'm doing and he's allowing me to get something done for him because I'm willing to do it. Okay, and just run without any handcuffs on your wrists or ankle chains on you. Run like somebody out of a gate, like a racehorse, and finish strong. All the glory to you, Lord Jesus, amen. Um, Kenny says, yeah, I imagine biological male fighting each other in women's final. God's intervention is really needed. It's so disgusting. I, I it drives me crazy, Kenny. I like, it's gotten so bad. You know, um, he makes salvation so easy, Linda. Absolutely he does. There is one thing I wanna mention before I let y'all go. It was on my mind to mention this during the reading of Revelation 19. But you know, we're in heaven and we're rejoicing over Babylon's destruction, okay? That's part of Revelation 19. Everybody knows in 19 that Jesus is literally coming back and this is, you know, but the, 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 the other aspect, it says that we were all rejoicing because God avenged the blood of the saints, okay? I wanna, I wanna highlight something um, for y'all to think about, okay? Who are those saints that God is avenging that Babylon was involved in shedding their blood? Well, this is like the short answer that I would like to give you as before I, before I sign off, is that this spirit of Ishtar has been around for a long time. If you read the Bible from cover to cover, you will see this, the blood of the saints many multiple times. And even the Romans feeding Christians to lion, um, the Christians to lions and things like that, boiling them in oil, executing them. So what I'm telling you is God is literally, he's destroying a nation, but he's actually, he is destroying and judging those spirits that were involved in that too. Okay, the, avenging the blood of the saints. Do you think that it's just people that's gonna be judged in this um, time in the book of Revelation? No, all those evil spirits are gonna be judged too. They're, gonna be, they're going to be cast into the bottomless pit along with Satan. And then there's that great white throne judgment someday. So yeah, 
we will get there. There's more to talk about in Revelation 20 and 21 and 22, but that's it for tonight. Thank you guys and gals. I really appreciate your time. Uh, we're all done for now. I think it was about an hour or so, something like that. It usually is. Um, share the Bible study for me, guys and gals, okay? And if people watch it, they do. If they don't, it's okay. But we're here to give them an opportunity to hear what God has to say because we're in a movie and the movie's real. It's not fiction. And God is showing us what we're about, what we're seeing and what we're about ready to experience. If you're a Christian, we have a great future. God bless all of you too. Thank you very much for sharing. See y'all later, okay? I'll see you in Revelation 20 coming very soon. God bless you. Have a good night.